Hello and welcome back to another episode of the 2020 Podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Harbir Sayan. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here as always, guys. Always appreciate the time, uh, taking the time out of your busy days to join us. And I'm always trying to bring on guests that can really help us expand and grow. And today is no exception. I have the wonderful Dr. Anna Jurisic here today. She is a low vision specialist based in Toronto. And she's really had a passion for low vision for 27 years. She's helped over thousands of patients over this period of time. She's seen patients from all over, all corners of Canada, and even from around the world. She's an international speaker, and she's the creator of the Vision Enhancing Method, which I'm very excited to learn more about today. Thank you so much, Dr. Jurisic, for joining us. Thank you, Harbir, for having me. As I said, uh, when we talked a few weeks ago, I'm a big fan of your podcast. So thank you for sharing all this great information and, and interviewing everyone that you are uh, and sharing the information to optometrists, not just in Canada, but all over uh, North America and the world. So congratulations on such a great job of what you do. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Thank you. I have a beard, so you might not be able to tell, but I'm blushing. Tell us a little bit. Let's learn a little bit more about you, Dr. Jurisic, because really, you know, yes, we've spoken a couple of times now, and I'm so impressed, so, so impressed with everything that you've done and built. And I really want more of our colleagues to know about you and what you're doing and learn from you. So tell us a little bit more about who you are and um, let's dive in from there kind of how have you gotten to where you are you know where you've practiced and that type of thing thank you yeah so harbira as you mentioned i've been practicing for 27 years i'm a graduate of the university of waterloo school of optometry class of 1996 so it uh, i sometimes still shake my head thinking that i've been doing this for 27 years and yeah. you would have asked me all those years ago i think okay i'd be a lot older and uh, that's a long time I am still absolutely passionate about what I do and I enjoy seeing the patients that I've been seeing. When I first graduated, I went back to my hometown of Tecumseh, Ontario, which is just outside of Windsor. So I practiced in Windsor and Tecumseh mm. and I worked as an associate and I was just doing routine eye exams. And within the first few months of practicing, one of the practices was right across the hall from a prominent ophthalmologist. He's actually really well known, being one of the leaders in refractive surgery, Dr. Tafor. And he would do, when he'd see some of his cataract patients, if they didn't have optometrists, they'd send them over to our clinic across the hall. And I was seeing more and more people with macular degeneration. And I knew they just didn't need glasses. They needed low vision aids. And at the time at our clinic, we had a few handheld magnifiers. Nobody was doing low vision services down in Windsor. People were being sent back to Waterloo, where I trained. That would be a three-hour drive for them to compute to uh, to Waterloo. And anyone who has done your clinic rotations and low vision, you know these, these exams in the university setting take about three-plus hours. That's why, unfortunately, a lot of people remember low vision as being slow vision. So <laughs> here are these people. They've traveled three hours to get there. They'd be in the clinic for over three hours. And they'd either stay overnight or come back. And I reached out to one of my classmates, a really good friend of mine. And at the time, he was working at the Scarborough Low Vision Center. And he said, Anna, you know what to do. We were taught everything that you need to do. Why are you sending these patients to Waterloo? You can provide the services in Windsor. And that's how it all started. He kind of guided me, told me what some of the aids that he was recommending, uh, what he was doing well with. And I started bringing the low vision services within the practice I was working as an associate. And I'm really grateful that the optometrist I worked with was, um, he recognized the need. And um, a few years later in 2000, there was an opportunity for me to be able to open up my own clinic. And so I decided to open up my own um, private practice, full scope optometry, optometry clinic with a low vision center within it. It was kind of unheard of anywhere in Southwestern Ontario. Mm -hmm. And a big reason I want to also open up the practice is um, I was really tired of those gray laminate medical settings of offices. You have the gray laminate counters, cabinets. I wanted a boutique style optometry office. And in 2000, what I was able to create was unheard of in Southwestern Ontario at the time. And, and um, I'm really proud of what I was able to create. And in, like I said, I had the low vision clinic within there. And I also had hired a low vision assistant who was legally blind. Her mm -hmm. son was a patient of mine. Wow. And I recognized how important it would be to be able to have somebody who could relate with the patients. So yeah, once right. I was done, she would be able to work with the patients. She had a CCTV in her low vision demo room. 
Um, and it was really a great relationship. And eventually, because of my husband's work, it brought us back to Toronto, where he's originally from. So in 2009, the practice was sold. Um, it had grown to five doctors, nine staff. Oh. Um, I sold it to one of my classmates. And then I had this opportunity where we had just started our family. We had two kids at the time and nobody knew me in Toronto, like nobody. Um, nobody knew about the work that I did. Whereas in Windsor, I created a wonderful reputation. I had the ophthalmologist referring patients to me, local colleagues, optometrists referring to me. In Toronto, it was only my um, colleagues who were friends who knew what I was able to do. And I remember my husband asked, do you want to open up another practice? And having two little ones, I knew that putting 80 hours a week between mm -hmm. some patients and doing the business side of things, I didn't want to have a full scope practice. I could not I could not see myself being in a new city with two really little ones um, because they're both at that time under the age of four, um, actually under the age of three. And so I said, no, I just want to do a living. It's such an underserviced area. I really enjoy it. Um, I love helping the patients. And my idea was to work with ophthalmologists. And originally I wanted to go and work in the hospital setting in a retinal clinics. And I remember I, you know, I went outside my comfort zone and I drew Grew up a resume, cover letter, everything to tell what I was able to do, the lectures I was already doing. And I sent out 30 of these letters out to ophthalmologists throughout um, the immediate Toronto area. And I was able to set up some interviews with some, some key ophthalmologists, especially the chief of ophthalmology at um, three of the hospitals. Wow. And I will always appreciate the conversation I had with Dr. Berger. He's a, a prominent retinal specialist here in, in Toronto. At the time, he was the chief of ophthalmology at St. Mike's Hospital. And he was candid. He said, you know, for you as an optometrist here in 2009 to be able to work in a hospital setting, it's virtually impossible because of all the obstacles. So that crushed my idea of being with the retinal specialists who I knew were seeing the patients I wanted to be able to help because many of them were all working in these hospital settings. And that's when I focused on private practices, private clinics, and through another colleague of mine, really good friend, uh, he introduced me to um, Dr. Craneman, uh, a prominent glaucoma specialist in Toronto. And I was so fortunate, he recognized what I was talking about he recognized the need uh, for low vision services and recognized there weren't a lot of options in Toronto, let alone Canada. And he gave me the opportunity and I was with him for nine years. Eventually I worked also with another retinal specialist, Dr. Chowdhury, uh, another impressive specialist here in, in the city. And knowing that my schedule will always have to revolve around the ophthalmologist schedules as well, I eventually decided that, you know, with all these years, I've been doing it for over 20 years, I decided it was time for me to just branch off again on my own. And now I have a low vision clinic where I rent space within an optical. And I did that because the optician that um, I work with, he's actually worked with low vision for almost 40 years. Oh, wow. So okay. Between myself and him, we have nearly 67 years of experience together. He gets my prescriptions because I do a lot with prism relocation, um, some really interesting um, uh, complex designs, because I always say the foundation of any low vision assessment has to start once you've done the vision goals, knowing what a patient wants in terms of the goals, the next foundation is actually a really good refraction. Hmm. Because if I'm going to optimize their vision, and that's what I always say, I'm here to maximize any remaining vision a person has, so they can do the vision goals they have. And it starts with a really good refraction and um, it's key before I show them any of the other options that are out there, which is the part that I get super excited about. But that's kind of my venture in 27 years down in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's a lot of stuff. And it's, it's, it's amazing that you've been through so many different steps and spoken to so many different people and different cities. Quirky little fact, I went to Tecumseh Elementary. So the name all of a sudden brought back all these mem memories, but that was here in Vancouver, of course. Well, look at that. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you would think in a big city like Toronto, there's going to be a huge need for for these types of services. And I'm sure, you know, after a little while, you've seen that the need for it there. You know, a lot of what you, you're kind of getting into at the end of that, like, of, you know, kind of telling your story was the refraction um, and the way you prescribe and complex prescriptions. And I feel like that side of the conversation 
starts to scare people a little bit about like, whoa, I can't do low vision because that's like complex stuff that I don't really have the knowledge in. I don't really practice that way. But, you know, one thing we, we want to talk about is this was where you got what you do now. You got here on your own practicing and learning it yourself. You didn't do a residency. Um, you know, so one thing we wanted to do was kind of encourage our, our colleagues to kind of do a little bit more about this, more of this, more low vision type of care and least uh, understanding how to start that care for our patients. But I think, again, I think we get a little scared of like, oh, that stuff's a little too complex. What do you say in that regard as far as somebody who's maybe doing general practice and wants to learn a bit more about this? Yeah, I'm really glad that you highlight this. This is one of the reasons that I actually have gone outside my comfort zone all these years and I do lecture on the topic. And it's because uh, we as optometrists, we're trained. You know, we were first trained in refraction and we have all the other elements with the ocular health, the binocular vision. I always see low vision as being really the full encompassing aspect of what optometry is to a higher level because you take everything into consideration. And when I see a patient, it's a very integrative approach. And like I said, the refraction is key. Everybody who practices optometry has the tools that they need to do a really good refraction. And that's one of the reasons that's kind of the basis of this whole vision enhancing method that I've created because this part of a prism relocation, when I went to school, we only knew to use prism if somebody had an eye turn, binocular vision issues, or if they've had a stroke and they have a hemianopsia and you had to shift the visual field. Well, there's an element of using prism relocation on anybody who has a central macular defect or even slight RP changes where all I'm doing is displacing that central focal point, not to hit the immediate center at the macular roots of finest detail vision, but in the area just next to it that might be healthier, that island of vision that they have. And you'd be surprised how much a person can appreciate even a one diopter um, prism that's added, half diopter, a lot of my RXs even have a half diopter, um, two diopter. So when I see all the stuff that's happening with the neural lens, I get excited because here's another way that the prism has been added into the way optometry can practice. Mm -hmm. well, I've been doing prism relocation for years now, and that's one of the tricks of how I'm able to optimize a person's prescription. I often tell a patient, they probably have never experienced this because it's normally not done in the standard exam. doesn't mean it doesn't have to be done. If someone has um, low vision, especially someone practicing in remote areas, uh, people can't travel necessarily to go to a low vision clinic because it's quite a distance to find somebody. Yep. All you need is one, a proctor, two, trial frame, three, your trial frame set. So when I do my prism relocation, after I've done, you know, I do RET on every patient because it gives me a lot more information. I really master retinoscopy, which uh, I remember when I first graduated and having the full scope practices. I love the auto refractor. Yeah. However, there's a key to retinoscopy and uh, it gives me a lot, a lot of information. So everyone gets a RET with me. And um, then I fine tune it. Then I'll trial frame what I have as a distance refraction. And I start using the prisms to find out how to optimize that best part that they have. And that can make a difference. And then, of course, with that higher reading ad. So I always, whenever I see a prescription of someone who has vision loss and they've come in and they've seen someone else. And if I see they've been given a plus 350 ad or a four ad, I comment to that patient, you had a great doctor. <laughs> because... They didn't rely on the formula that once you pass a certain age, it should be a plus 250 ad, or I'm going to stop at most as a plus 275 ad. That formula goes out the window as soon as you're dealing with someone with vision loss. And so that's something everyone can do. And that little bit of extra ad that you have to educate about good lighting and having to hold it much closer that can actually bridge a gap for a while um, until maybe if they start suffering more vision loss where then they have to go into additional aids to help maximize. But we're optometrists. We know how to do great refraction. It's how to fine tune it. Um, so when somebody says they can't do it, 
that's a choice they've made. They can either choose to spend the extra time, which sometimes means they might have to come back. You might have to modify how much time you're, uh, you're allocating for an eye exam for someone that you think might need more time. But to say, I can't do it, and that's actually a choice or a decision of not taking action. And everyone has the ability to take action. Something I tell my kids all the time. We talked, I have four kids. Yeah, when they say they can't do something, um, they can choose not to, or they can choose to do something. Right. Same thing to reminds all of that, Reminds me of that, is it Confucius? Maybe he who says he can and he who says he can't are both right. Yeah, absolutely. And the other so, thing that I always say, you can't try. You either can or you cannot. They, right. There is no try because it's in And between. that was Yoda, right? So that yeah. was. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, Good. Thank you for that. You know, and again, like I'm one of those doctors, I'm one of those op optometrists who's like, I don't think I have the skill set for low vision. I don't think I'm set up for it. But really, as you're saying, you need a retinoscope for opter trial set. And pretty much you're, you, you've already done a good chunk of, and that's talking <clears throat> from a technical skill standpoint, but really there's one other thing, big thing that's needed. And it's not a technical skill. It's a personality trait. I don't know what's the right way to put it. And that's empathy, right? And I know empathy is a word that's thrown around generally a lot, but this is one scenario where it is extremely important. Um, and I know we wanted to talk a little bit about that. So tell me why empathy is important, where it fits into this whole conversation. It's actually such a huge element. And the whole art of communication is huge when you're dealing with someone with vision loss or anyone um, who's having more difficulty. And empathy is something that, um, you know, some people, it seems more natural for them to have the empathy. And I, and I know that that's something that I've always been able to relate with my patients. I will always say um, I'm not in their shoes. I never want to say that I know exactly how you're feeling because I can't. I cannot know what it's like 24-7 with them with their vision loss. I may have an understanding of what I think they may go through. And so... Um, it's actually so, so key. Um, I almost have like a, a little radar that I, I've recognized and I've taken a lot of courses to help even fine tune my own skills of the art of communication and understanding how people think and, and um, process things. And what I realized early on when I took some of these courses is that I actually have that natural rapport with my patients. And part of it was because I naturally am a very empathetic person. And I can pick up on patients if I sense that they might be depressed. And that's a huge thing because many of my patients are being seen, especially if they have macular degeneration, they're seeing their ophthalmologist usually every four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, if they're getting injections. And if they're lucky, they're spending five minutes with that doctor. That doctor has so many patients that they're seeing. I know, I worked in ophthalmology clinics. I know how many patients are seen in the day. They don't necessarily have the time to spend with patients. Sometimes they will with some. Unfortunately, they can't have the time for all of them, just the way the system and how they've made their schedule. And when I see a patient, I've scheduled that extra time. If I pick up that someone is depressed or I think they're depressed, I actually bring up that conversation of how are you doing with the vision loss? And often they start opening up. And the reason is if they're in that stage of early depression, which is very similar stages as if, if someone's going through the early stages of vision loss, it's like losing their best friend. They've had their vision from day one, longer than most people they know. And so when they're losing their vision, they're going through the same grieving stages as losing a loved one. And they can be in that stage of anger. Why me? the denial, it's often not until they get to that stage of acceptance that they're open to the possibilities. And I know I've seen patients where I see that they're actually in that deep stage of depression at that point. So I start talking about that because I know that it's a conversation that's not normally uh, taking place in examination rooms. And I want to know how they're doing. I'm very fortunate here in Toronto. I've gotten to know some key people. Um, one is this amazing psychiatrist that my patients told me about. Um, she's a medical doctor. She's a psychiatrist, works at a local hospital, but she has a niche practice where she sees people with vision loss. And we've become friends over the years as well. And she herself is legally blind. 
So who best to talk to than someone who actually lives it every day? Or there's another uh, agency that's called Balance here in Toronto, and they've actually expanded their, um, it's Balance for Blind Adults, and they have these amazing services that now have expanded past Toronto, where they have someone who is part of their team, and she and her sister both are legally blind. They have an inherited retinal condition, and she provides um, support as well and therapy for people with vision loss, either in group settings or one-on-one. And I share this with my patients. It's on my resource list that we give out to our patients because it's so huge because many times no one talks about it. I've had far too many people who have sat on my chair who've told me when we actually tap into some of this and they said, you know what? Yeah, I, I've been very depressed. I've thought about suicide. Some have actually attempted and I'm so fortunate they never succeeded. And there's one person in particular that I think about and he saw me, I had told him about this doctor, um, the psychiatrist, and he wasn't ready to see her at the time. He reached out by email. I am so happy it didn't fall into my junk mail. I saw his email. He reached out. He wanted to get connected and have me refer, and I did. Luckily, she was able to see him in a timely manner. It was later revealed he had a suicide plan for the age of 50. He wow. reached out to me four months before his 50th birthday. Wow. He's still here today, which is six years later. And that's one of the reasons that um, I was talking to you that uh, you've inspired me with all your podcasts, that I'm launching my own uh, podcast called Seeing Again. Uh, podcast and it's really geared for people with vision loss their caregivers anyone dealing with individuals with vision loss and blindness so any of our eye care um, colleagues as well and the big thing that i want to be tapping into is some of these great stories of patients i've met over the 27 years who are actually so inspirational i know paralympians that i've gotten to meet i've met um, ultra marathoners I've met people who have started their own business and have succeeded like every realm. And I want to share these stories with people to give them some hope and know that maybe there are different possibilities, especially when they think there isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I find that there's not a lot of great sources out there. So if I can uh, provide hope to people, I know I do that when patients get to see me one-on-one, but not everyone gets to sit in my chair, especially uh, even though I've seen people from coast to coast and including you know Nunavut and the territories, they can all sit in my chair. And this is one way that I know I've helped thousands. I don't want to stop at helping thousands. I want to be helping hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people with vision loss by giving them the information, giving them knowledge, giving them hope. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. Powerful um, and inspirational stories in there. You know, the patients who I think we all understand as optometrists that like vision loss and, you know, not to not to um, minimize any of this conversation, but we even even patients who have dry eye, like severe dry eye, they go through these kind of state different states of, of depression or, or, you know, um, their you know, mental well-being is definitely affected by these conditions. Um, and you can only imagine when somebody's actually had severe vision loss, how much it could affect their their mental state as well. And the fact that you're taking the time to address that with them and really connect with them is huge. And and also really, really interesting to hear the inspirational stories of people who've had the vision loss, but instead of just letting it control their lives, they're taking action and using it to as a way to build a business or help other people. I think that's really inspirational as well. And I think people will, you know, want to hear more of these stories. So I'd, you know, really look forward to when you you do roll out your podcast and start to share that information. I'll be sure to make sure we we spread the message as well. Um, I'm happy to help you however I can to make sure we get that off the ground. I think it's going to be really powerful. Yeah. And if I can just add to this topic, one thing that I always, whenever I do these lectures um, and it's to our um, uh, eye care colleagues, the ophthalmologists, optometrists, or anyone in the healthcare, when you have that patient sitting in your chair, um, if it's a person with vision loss, dry eye, any patient who sits in your chair, if all of us optometrists would actually think about that patient as if it was their loved one. What would they want that loved one to be told by their eye doctor? We're the professionals. We have the knowledge. Patients and loved ones are going to be searching the internet for anything that can help them. So if we just even stopped and thought, um, even if you have a diagnosis that you have to give someone like 
you know, I, before um, I, I diagnosed someone with a coronal melanoma and that's not the news you ever want to tell a patient that they, they have this. So how do you relay that information? Like, you know, you're in beyond the slit lamp. You don't want to go, oh, mm-hmm. you know, the patient's going to wonder what, what just happened here. What did you see? You want to be using your words very selectively. And the best way to know what words to use is think of that person who's sitting in that chair as a loved one or yourself. What would you want to know? Wouldn't you want to know everything that's available to get them to see better? That's what I do with every patient in my chair. Um, I know what it's like to get a diagnosis of a loved one where my father was diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And the doctor who did the surgery told my mother and brother that my father should stop all of his meds while he was in recovery. My father didn't hear this conversation and he has six months to live. That is not, and my mother is a very strong um, European lady. I'm, I'm Croatian in background, and she's a very strong European lady. And she told that doctor, you are not allowed to speak to my husband. We're going to have the doctor who had referred to you to speak to my husband. You're not given permission to tell him this. Mm-hmm. And my brother, um, he's a dentist. My sister's an optometrist. So my brother, right away, started researching. Um, and this is back in 2005, the year of my sister was actually um, months away from graduating. And he found that there is alternative therapies in the US. My brother took my, my parents down to the US. That doctor who started a technique told us of a doctor up in Calgary. I took my parents to Calgary to see that doctor. That doctor told us there was a doctor in Montreal. <laughs> and, my, and we asked my father, do you want to see that one? He went to the one in Montreal. And we let my father make the decision because, you know, I was there for the Calgary appointment. My brother was there for the one in North Carolina and in Montreal. And my dad chose the one in Montreal because this uh, procedure was not being done in Ontario. Um, that that doctor respected quality of life. He said, I won't know exactly how much I have to remove because um, it was going to be even like a chemo bath. That was going to take a few hours and he was going to bathe my dad's inside GI tract because he had a rare cancer, cancer, the appendix, that if it would have been caught while it was still encased. And my dad had complained for 10 years to his family doctor and to a specialist. (coughs) And it spread to his peritoneum, the inner lining of his GI tract. And it was like salt and pepper everywhere. He said, I won't know until I'm inside to see what I need to do. And he actually didn't do the 12 hour procedure. He did eight hours because he knew that if he did the full procedure, my dad would not have quality of life. My dad lived almost three years from that original point of diagnosis. He got to see my daughter, my first daughter um, um, get born. He got to watch and walk down my sister um, down the aisle as she got married. Um, He missed meeting My second daughter, he passed away nine days before I had my second daughter. So I know what it's like when you get a diagnosis that is not that great. And also knowing how we had to be the advocates. And so I don't want, I know patients are out there. They want to know the information. And some of them are sometimes told nothing more can be done. Those were terms that I used to hear when I first graduated or over, you know, 25, 26 years ago. At that time, if you had macular degeneration, you had bleeding. We didn't have, it was before Visiodine, it was before any of the anti-VEGF um, injections. They would use a hot thermal laser and I would use the example. They would take as if there was a cigarette butt and, you know, sizzle the skin on top to get to that blood vessel that's leaking. But it would actually sizzle that overlying tissue that was still healthy. And these patients afterwards, it would be like, I went, I did, they did the laser and my vision's worse because now they had a bigger blind spot, mm-hmm. not recognizing that they're trying to prevent it from continuing to leak. Um, but people were told nothing more can be done. It still happens today. That shouldn't be the case. So that's one of the reasons I have gone outside my comfort zone. I do speak. I try to educate as many people, not just uh, the eye care professionals and healthcare professionals, but patients, because I've been wanting to eradicate that phrase. Nothing more can be done because there's always something that can be done. Well, that's it. That's Amazing to hear. And I mean, sorry to hear, of course, about your father, but nice that there were other options and that you guys didn't rest on that one diagnosis. Uh, and there were others out there who were able to help him, you know, live longer and have a quality of life. And that's something that we are able to do from the vision side of things with our patients as well. If we're not able to do that ourselves in our office, 
are there some resources that you are aware of that we could share now as Canadian ECPs where we might be able to send our patients to help them get other services and care that they, they deserve? Yeah, the first thing I recommend is find out who in your area might provide low vision services. If there's anyone listening to this talk who does low vision services, I highly recommend you reach out to all of your colleagues within your area. Let them know because I get that question often. Unfortunately, we don't have a really great national registry letting people know who provides low vision services, who doesn't. You know, there's always the option of referring to um, the branch from the CNIB vision loss rehabs that are located throughout the country. But you also have to remember that key foundation of that good refraction is a basis. I mean, if they go to CNIB or vision, lo or vision loss rehab in the centers, they're only going to work on the vision that somebody has at that point in time and shows them some aids that they might have. Um, but they can't do the spectacle mounted aids that we can. There are great telescopic aids that we're regulated as optometrists that we know how to do. We're regulated to dispense it. So that's something that I, I definitely recommend that, um, you know, it's always a key, key refraction, but find out who does it. If someone's interested in learning how to do low vision, that's where I was, uh, I just shared with you earlier before we went on this call that um, I just was able to confirm this week, I'm going to be putting together a, um, a low vision series. It's kind of a how-to. It'll be multi-series step lectures that will be available online. And it highlights what I call my vision enhancing method. The vision enhancing method is what I've termed all my 27 years of experience my recipes of what works, what works for certain conditions, um, because what's going to work with somebody who has a central defect, defect with macular degeneration or star guards, um, any macular issues is going to be different than my patient who has tunnel vision from retinitis pigmentosa or might have optic neuropathy. Um, so there are going to be differences and that's what will be part of this series that we're going to be putting together and there'll be ways to access and, and, uh, it'll be on my website. There'll be a way to link to that, that branch of any of the lectures that any of the colleagues, um, because I've had people reach out to me from other countries around the world wanting to know about low vision. There's not a lot of sources of live sessions, unfortunately, in this topic in Canada, um, often, I'm one of the ones who do the live sessions. I enjoy it. I very, very much do. I've even spoken in the U.S. multiple times at low vision, uh, um, low vision conferences. When I first started back in, I remember going 97, 98, 99, I used to go to the academy meetings down in the U.S. to pick up as much as I could because uh, in terms of low vision in other areas because we weren't getting that here. And this is before we had to have mandatory CE. I've always been on this path of learning, growing, because there's always something new to learn. And as I learn more, I course correct, I change. It's something that's always evolving. Sometimes I wish low vision, um, the solutions that are out there would evolve faster than they have. But there are some great options that are out there in terms of digital aids, um, digital magnifiers, because I find seven out of 10 of my patients prefer reading white on black. You can't do that with a handheld magnifier. Handheld magnifier isn't for long periods of reading. That's for quick spotting. And there's some really cool um, uh, camera aids like the Aura Cam that you clip onto the cam onto your glasses. That's an intuitive camera system, and it will do text to speech. So somebody who has no vision or who has various degrees of vision loss can benefit from that. Or the new Envision glasses that uses an app, and it's based on the um, original Google Glass where it's all AI based. So AI is always evolving. We, you know, ChatGPT came out in November and there's all these platforms that do all this AI now. It's happening even in the field of vision loss solutions as well. And that's where, that's my area of passion is how can I convey some of this new technology to patients? Um, the only downfall is that um, here in Canada, there's not a lot of funding for any of these kind of specialized newer techno technology aids. And if you're in some of the provinces, there's zero funding for any kind of low vision aids, which is unfortunate for many of these patients. Here in Ontario, we have a program that's called the Assistive Devices Program or ADP, but it's a very antiquated program that they have not increased their fees in 25 years. 
even though I've gotten to sit on meetings where the association asked me to, to speak and change the way the fee structure is and have it go more towards some of this new technology. And unfortunately, the government at this point doesn't want to increase these fees. They don't want to cover some of these specialized aids, which is so unfortunate. I'm not sure how it is in BC, um, but I find that what a lot of people don't recognize is that one third of Canadians who are in the working age class and have, um, who are legally blind or severe vision loss are actually employed. Two thirds are unemployed. This is here in Canada. We're an advanced country. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to have a go-to person. He, uh, his name uh, was Tom. He unfortunately passed away um, of cancer during COVID. And he was my iPhone tech guru guy got to me in 2010. And anytime I would lecture, I would reach out to Tom to say, what apps, what do I need to be telling people at my conferences when I'm speaking? He was completely blind. And he would teach people at Balance for Blind Adults how to use their iPhone and what apps to use, how to use a computer. He had no vision. He was completely blind. Wow. He was a reason in 2010, I updated my hot pink Motorola flip phone to get my first iPhone because how could I talk about technology if I wasn't using it myself? And uh, he used to go and volunteer in Cuba at the schools for the blind and bring old iPhones down there to show and teach. And he would tell me that when he'd come back to Canada, he felt like he was coming to a third world country. Wow. And that's a powerful statement for that's someone right. who is living with vision loss and blindness. And, you know, he, he even did his schooling in, in, in Texas. Um, that's a powerful statement. And hopefully this conversation will change before I ever retire. I don't want it to be that once I retire. I've been doing this 27 years and we're still at a very similar spot in some, some cases which is such a shame. And that's yeah. where I'm a huge advocate for individuals with vision loss. It is such a shame and pretty eye opening, pardon the pun, that somebody would come to our country and say something along those lines, uh, as we usually would, of course, think of as ourselves as a developed and advanced country in, in most forms and ways. But I think with someone as passionate as you really leading the charge and doing all the things you're doing, as well as now really getting out there, it's one thing, as you said, to be helping patients within your exam room, and that's extremely powerful. But to now get out of there and spread the word in all these different mediums, so through your podcast that you're going to develop, through the vision enhancing method uh, program that you're going to develop, I think we'll start to create more of a groundswell and, and more you know uh, awareness, and hopefully that'll push companies to start to develop more technologies and maybe governments to, to develop more programs. Um, that'll support that new demand that's coming up. So uh, you're the perfect person to be at the front of all of that. And I really hope that it starts to come to fruition. Like you said, before you before you retire, for sure. Exactly. Thank I'm not you. getting younger. <laughs> well, I, I, want to are, say, but... I want to say how old I am, um, but I'm not getting younger. Um, well, you know what? Um, you're you're doing a great job. And you, regardless of your the age number, I definitely sense a, a real feeling of youth and energy with you when I talk to you. So as long as that's there, I think that's all that matters. So thanks so much, Anna. Thank you so much for sharing all of this information. I think this is going to be powerful for anybody who listens to it. Any, well, actually, before we wrap up, where can people find you um, and learn more about you? Uh, one, they can go onto my website. It's drlowvision.com. So D-R-L-O-W v-i-s-i-o-n.com and uh, we've updated the website recently so it's a really big educational platform ever since the fall of 2022 um, anybody who signs up for the newsletter on the website they're added to um, a newsletter that i send out about every week sometimes every two weeks now and during the summer but it's usually every week and it's something related to vision um, one of the hottest topics was actually when i talked about depression I can't tell you how many people, um, if they came into the clinic, um, mentioned to me how um, they found that message to be really powerful. And so it's a great resource that you can even share with your own patients. The, any of the previous newsletters are all under the blog post. And that's where they can also, patients can even find out information about various vision solutions that are out there. 
if ever uh, somebody can't find somebody to do low vision in their area, if you have someone that you have um, who has a vision impairment, no one's doing it in the area. Since COVID, one of my suppliers has created a kit that is a diagnostic kit. So I've actually done virtual assessments over Zoom. When we actually have people pick up um, vision aids, any of the digital aids, if they can't do the, um, on, uh, the in-person training, we do it online now. Like we've pivoted since COVID because we we never imagined doing it through a live Zoom call, but we've been doing it and it's actually worked out really, really well, especially if somebody needs extra follow-up. Um, you can always send me an email directly at drjuricic at drlowvision.com. So D-R-J-U-R-I-C-I-C at drlowvision.com. I am on Facebook as well, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. My kids are convincing me that I need to be on TikTok. And Harbir, <laughs> I see you've done some TikTok videos. I well, love you. I, I do have some ideas for some really quick TikTok videos. So Good. I don't think I'm going to be a TikTok star, but you never know. You never um, know. Like I said, I keep expanding and going outside my comfort zone. And Good. if I can share a funny story, yeah. um, when I graduated, if you would have asked me back in 1996, when I was graduating, if ever I would actually speak in front of large groups of people, do a podcast like this, anything like that, I would have just like sunk in my sh in my shoes, um, sh shaken my head because most of my classmates might not have realized that I rarely ever put up my hand to ask a question. That was a fear of mine to put up my hand to ask a question. I would, I, you know, I studied, I absorbed all the information and any of my classmates know my notes were well sought after. They were mm -hmm. color coded, very neat. My writing for any of my colleague, my classmates is not the same anymore. I do write a lot faster, but I had really beautiful notes that anyone who knows John Mastronardi, ask him how popular my notes were with his M&M production company, where they were photocopying my notes and charging. This is back in 1995, 96, uh, where we had Kinko and he'd go photocopy. I missed out on requesting royalties for all my notes <laughs> that he copied. Uh, and it's a long standing joke that him and I have. Um, but with that, I was going to say, when I graduated, the most one of the most embarrassing moments in my life happened at our convocation. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in putting together memories of our four years because i was on the yearbook committee i love taking photos anybody who knows me knows i take lots of photos my kids will say i have thousands of photos on my phone and um we put a video together and i end up turning to my my classmate my dearest friend uh, one of my dearest friends rita and i said who's our dog victorian and then a minute later i heard my name i sunk in my seat mm. and they said my name again and it was Dr. Strong down at the front. And when I finally made it down to the podium and you know, in the auditorium at University of Waterloo, he looked at me and says, as if you didn't know. I said, I didn't. I probably have on record the shortest valedictorian speech ever in optometry school. Oh. So if I even hit three minutes, I'm impressed. So People won't remember that, but I remember that. And it was pretty embarrassing. So um, I reached out and I've gone outside my comfort zone. And um, if I could survive that moment in life, I know I can survive many moments. That's a pretty epic moment in probably the wrong way. But uh, how did you not know? <laughs> Somebody forgot to tell you. I don't even know if they even, I, I don't even remember seeing if we were voting for a valedictorian so um maybe well uh, maybe great honor. Assumed, yeah well, I, isn't a valedictorian <laughs> the person who just has the highest grade in the class so maybe you had that and the you they just thought well she'll probably know that she has the highest grade and that's it there you go there you go so i you know what it was uh it was pretty embarrassing and um yeah i survived. wow that's a, and, wow that's quite the story well yes you certainly come very very far from that and um, i'm excited i'm glad to see that you have <laughs> and uh, that's a really great story to share yeah. so thank when you people for say they can't do something it's a choice <laughs> yeah, it's a choice it's a choice thank you so much for that um thank you so much anna and um you know i look forward to seeing more and more about what you're doing coming out and i'm definitely happy to share everything that i can as far as links that you've m just mentioned we'll put those in the show notes so you know whoever wants to see whether you're watching on youtube check the caption or on your podcast app just kind of scroll 
scroll down and you'll see the stuff there. So thank you again, and I appreciate it. And uh, thank you everybody who's watching and listening to the 2020 podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll be back with another one very soon. Thank you so much.